What if I told you that one of the boldest attempts to build a people's car for Africa came not from Africa, but from a British photographer with no background in car manufacturing? In the 1980s, Anthony Howarth set out to design the perfect vehicle for the African continent. And while Porsche was trying to make a budget car for China, this guy was deep in the savannah, building something even crazier, the Africar. In this video, you'll hear the wild story of how a British filmmaker tried to build the ultimate African car, out of wood no less. We'll explore why it almost worked, what went wrong, and how the whole thing ended with jail time. So if you're into weird cars, forgotten history, and stories that don't end well, hit that subscribe button. And check out the Reddit too, links in the description. You might think this was just another eccentric Brit with a big idea, but Anthony Howarth actually knew what he was talking about. Back in the early 60s, he wasn't just traveling Africa, he was driving across it, over 100,000 kilometers on roads that were barely even roads. In fact, most of the time, there were no roads. A 300 kilometer journey could take days, and even a rugged Land Rover, which was Howarth's main ride, felt like a torture device. Repairs? You did them yourself. There was no service, no parts, no support. He used to say that in Europe or the US, distance is just a number. But in Africa, every kilometer is a challenge. And yet, he saw potential. The people couldn't afford cars, not yet. But he believed that would change. That someday, Africa would need its own car. A car made for those conditions. So he had a vision, the African people's car. Affordable, durable, easy to fix. And in the early 80s, he finally decided to build it. For several years, Anthony Howarth carefully developed his vision of a vehicle truly suited for Africa. Drawing from first-hand experience, he outlined several key principles. The car must be easy to build without a factory, using affordable materials and simple tools. The engine and transmission should come from widely available European cars, already familiar to local mechanics. And above all, it should have high ground clearance and front wheel drive, which offered a flat underbody and better handling on rough terrain. This was not a whimsical idea. It was a project rooted in logic and real world experience. Howarth had already found that a humble Austin 1100 could handle African roads just as well as a Land Rover. That realization shaped the blueprint for Africar. The construction was intentionally straightforward. A tubular steel chassis with body panels made from plywood infused with epoxy resin. A strong composite material used in aviation and boat building. The engine came from the Citroen GS, a 1.3 liter unit producing 66 horsepower known and serviceable across Africa. The gearbox was taken from the Citroen 2CV, simple, durable, and easy to repair. Howarth and his team considered every detail. The driver's seat was raised for better visibility. The bonnet was sloped. The windows were flat panes of glass that any glazier could replace. No power windows, just sliding vents. Ground clearance was 30 centimeters. Two 55-liter fuel tanks gave the vehicle a range of over 1,000 kilometers. Africar measured 4.3 meters long, 1.82 wide, 1.79 high, with a 2.75-meter wheelbase. The original plan included two main body styles, a pickup and a five-door wagon. But the team went further, developing a six-wheeled extended wheelbase prototype, designed with future upgrades in mind. The project was advancing with clear purpose and practical engineering. But like many ambitious ideas, it hit a familiar obstacle. Funding. Nearly everything was financed from personal savings, and without outside support, continuing development became increasingly difficult. To promote the project and raise funding, Anthony Howarth turned to his old contacts at the independent British TV network Channel 4. He pitched an idea a five-part documentary following the Africar project, and a grueling overland journey from Norway to Kenya 
to test the prototypes in real-world conditions. It wasn't just about the car. Howarth also aimed to highlight the day-to-day -day realities of life in Africa, the lack of infrastructure, the challenges of mobility, and the broader social context. In the 1980s, Western media often embraced such topics, and Howarth hoped the film might attract attention from NGOs, aid groups, or even potential backers. On February 14, 1984, three freshly built Africa prototypes left the UK and headed north to Norway. From there, they would begin a 30,000-kilometer journey across Europe and deep into Africa, including regions marked by poverty, lawlessness, and active conflict. The cars were far from refined. One of them, a six-wheeled extended version, had been assembled just days before departure. But even on icy Nordic roads, they held up surprisingly well. The real test came on the rough and unpredictable terrain of sub-Saharan Africa. Dirt, mud, rocks, rivers, heat, bureaucracy, and guns. The team encountered them all. The route had to be altered several times to avoid war zones or lawless territories. In Zaire, the crew was briefly detained and accused of smuggling undeclared radio equipment. The situation nearly escalated to a court case. And yet, the team, which included women as well as men, and all three Africars made it. They reached Nairobi, then returned to North Africa, and eventually back to England by ship. It wasn't just a successful field test. It was proof of concept. Africa, despite its rough edges, worked, right where it was needed most. For several months, Howarth focused on editing his documentary, while also trying to launch full-scale production of the Africa. The film finally aired on Channel 4 in 1987 and sparked some interest. But the car itself? That part wasn't going well. In fact, it was already falling apart. Despite having no steady funding, Howarth registered Africa International, rented a workshop at a defunct aircraft factory in Lancaster, and hired a small team. Even though the car was built from cheap materials, it still required money, and there simply wasn't enough. To raise funds, Howarth began offering pre-order certificates for the Africa. Buyers came in, including from Europe and even Australia. According to his estimates, launching full-scale production would require around 8 million pounds. He believed those funds would come. And perhaps that belief is what doomed the project. Instead of using the early deposits to build and deliver cars, Howarth decided to invest in developing a custom engine and gearbox to break free from dependence on Citroën. It was a bold idea, but dangerously premature. Not a single production car had been built yet. Eventually, the money dried up. Production stalled. Howarth asked his early buyers to pay the remaining balance, despite having no completed vehicles to offer. That didn't go over well. One furious customer broke into the workshop at night and stole a partially assembled Africar. It was a warning sign, and much worse was yet to come. In a last-ditch effort to save the project, Howarth flew to the United States, hoping to find investors. But while he was away, everything collapsed back home. Africa International was shut down, and all assets were seized. British authorities charged him with fraud, claiming he had taken money from customers for vehicles that didn't exist. Howarth firmly denied the accusations. But then came his biggest mistake. Instead of returning and facing the legal process, he chose to disappear. For six years, he remained in hiding in the U.S., believing the situation might somehow resolve itself. It didn't. When he finally returned to the U.K. in 1994, he was immediately arrested. The charges, financial misconduct, obstruction of justice, and failure to cooperate with investigators. He was sentenced to 15 months in prison. After serving his time, Howarth never returned to the Africa project. Instead, he shifted focus to designing lightweight boats, using his experience with wood and epoxy resin. Africa existed for just six years, from 1982 to 1988. Only three prototypes completed the North to Equator expedition 
and six additional units were assembled in Lancaster. Most of them ended up in private collections. And so ended the story of a car that could have changed Africa. Howarth had the vision, the drive, and even the engineering. But he lacked the one thing that mattered most, the ability to turn a dream into a sustainable reality. That's it for now. I hope you enjoyed this look at the Africar, a car that came close to transforming Africa, but ended in prison and obscurity. If you like content like this, consider subscribing. You can also join the discussion and see what I'm working on next in the subreddit. Link in the description and pinned comment. Thanks for watching, and see you in the next one.